the aspiration and the, the strategic plan is to unite the thousands of organizations and millions of activists and, and common cause so that we can defeat this crisis. Um, so in the last year, we've jumped into gear and I'm gonna share my screen a little bit and tell you where things have ended up. First, I'd like to share the uh, carbon clock. I'd like to start with this so we know exactly what we're up against. This comes out of Berlin, but there are several of them. The 1.5 degree scenario over here shows six years, eight months before we put enough pollution in the air of our pollution right now that we lock in 1.5. And then as you click on two degrees, you can see uh, 24 years from now, well, we will have surpassed the pollution levels that lock in two degrees. Between 1.5 and two degrees, there are a series of tipping points which uh, would really bring calamity and irreversible damage, such as ocean currents uh, stopping their current flow and um, the ice sheets melting, which again, set in a series of domino effects. So we have seven years, um, as I see the clock, to stop our pollution. So um, our, pro our project was um, working with all the coalitions to bring them together. And we've been networking ourselves into all these different tables of organizing circles because there's no central nationwide uh, campaign working on federal legislation. And in doing so, we were looking for the commonalities among all the various proposals. And what finally, the light finally went off that, oh my goodness, it's the mandates, it's these standards. And so now we've zeroed in on this, the Earth Bill, a 2030 moonshot for Earth. The Earth Bill would mandate 100% by 2030, renewable electricity, electric vehicles, and regenerative farming. Um, this is combined about 80% of the pollution solution and it's 100% of the political solution um, in the sense that the fossil fuel, big oil um, and big pharma, which is involved in big ag, those three industries really control our Congress. So if we tackle them in this uh, concise focused bill um, that simplifies all the you know, way too complex policy issues in, in this arena, um, I think we could break the back of those of their grip on Congress and then solve our pollution problem at the same time. So this is electricity, cars, and food. Three items that are consumer-oriented items that everyone can relate to. It's our production, it's our pollution, and it can be our solution if we work together. As you can see here, these are the percentage um, of these areas, once you electrify, once electricity goes 100% renewables, it could impact the industry number and of course the commercial residential number. So it's really 70, 80%. Then with agriculture, not only you're reducing the emissions, but by creating um, healthy soils, you're increasing their carbon sequestration. So the solution from just these three areas could be quite transformative. In terms of definitions, which is where a lot of this always breaks down in the discussions, renewable electricity is energy produced from wind, solar, geothermal, tidal wave, and existing hydropower is the way we're proposing the definition. Um, so that's very specific uh, so that it's explainable to the public. And then regenerative agriculture is longer, but it's again, very specific processes. And the idea is to make big ag, so the major uh, entities that can control the market share of any entity with over 10% market share in these arenas would be required to adopt these uh, practices. And it would reach about 243 million acres of agricultural land in the United States. And then it's very specific. All this boils down to just very, using very natural processes, not disturbing the soil and not using most importantly, fertilizers and chemicals. Um, the incentives and enforcements are also very important. The idea is to tie this to the ability to take general business tax deductions. So any corporation, you know, deducts its cost of office, staff, all of its, you know, purchases and things like that. And so we could double the deductions or credits for these transition to renewable energy sources. And then more importantly, eliminate deductions for non-compliance. So if by 2030, 
they've not reached 100% in these arenas, we would reduce, reduce their ability to take their deductions uh, by an equal amount. No business can really survive without these deductions, and it's better than credits, which can become cost of doing business. Again, the carbon clock, I just showed it, and that's why the 2030 deadline. If we could pass such a bill this year, or this Congress in 21 or 22, that gives us about eight years to actually accomplish the transition. Everyone knows that's a, an incredibly aggressive timeline, but that's what the science requires. This is, as I mentioned earlier, uh, distilled from many coalition positions. So I won't go into them here because they're all US coalition efforts, but our movement is extremely disjointed. There's no one leading it collectively and they're all doing their own policy proposals and yet they're not doing legislation. Some of them are. Um, and so you can just see from this that it really, these ideas of these goals um, are shared across many entities, including the House Climate Crisis Select Committee and certain legislation um, the difference is these people, these groups put these ideas as aspirational goals, and we're talking about putting them in law as mandates. I always ask the, the, the activists, what, are you, are, what would you get arrested for? Um, you know, a movement has to have legislative demands. You think of the Civil Rights Movement, the Equality Act, the Breathe Act, the Dream Act. We have, you know, you have bills, and that is what creates the political outside pressure to accomplish a particular goal. If you don't have that ask on the table, you can't get arrested for something. I was arrested three times for the New York bill and I didn't even like what was in it, but we got one passed because there was a bill. Um, so this is a clear demand for activists. We're working with the youth groups, Fridays for the Future, Youth for Nature, um, Extinction Rebellion. They're, they needed a demand. This will be that demand. The Earth Bill will be that demand. This is a unifying demand for the movement as you saw across those coalitions. It's importantly a real greenhouse gas reduction law that is measurable against time. And time is what is not our friend here. That is the fight we're really in. And that's the difference between um, all these wonderful initiatives from the Biden administration and this proposal is that, you know, you don't know how many businesses are gonna take advantage of cre tax credits, which are a huge part of this, this trillion dollars. You don't know how many businesses are gonna, you know, take advantage of loans and grants and incentive programs. You just don't know how fast that will happen. So you need something that is a mandate in law that will then uh, unleash the private sector potential to realize those goals. Everyone thinks the clean energy standards in the states, about 18 states have passed those, are critical because it sends a market signal to uh, the renewable energy companies to that there will be a procurement demand from the utility company to purchase the supply once they create it. And it will make their projects bankable and it gives everybody a real timeline. It's a positive message, the pollution solution. And I think responsibility is really important. I, I talked to somebody yesterday and they were like, well, you can't make this seem everybody's fault and everybody's responsibility, but it is our production. These companies create things for us. We are the consumers. It is our consumption and it is our pollution. Uh, so, and then again, a collective mission, which makes it exciting, a 2030 moonshot for Earth. We went to uh, the moon in a decade and uh, we didn't have the technology then. And now look what we, uh, we already have the technology, most of it for this mission. We can change this together and you can make it an exciting participatory thing. Electric customers can return their electric bills by saying we're going clean. All street lights can become car charging outlets. Uh, there are ways to make this an all-in together push. Strategically, none of these issues, as I mentioned earlier, has enough power alone. We have to unite across the sectors. We have shared opposition, big oil, big ag, big pharma. Politically, they control Congress. Mandates are their worst nightmare. This is what will call the question on the polluters and force them to change practices. And they're welcome to enter the clean revolution with everyone. No one says they have to stay attached to their old business models. Those models are killing our planet and destroying the future for humanity. This is not really a laughing matter anymore. We don't have time to waste. And this will ultimately enable us to retake our governments from the grip, the grip of power that these entities have, not just in the United States, but around the globe. We also have a ground game, adopt a district, 
I believe in the power of the grassroots. I think it's our only hope. We have 435 congressional districts in the United States. I imagine you're organized somehow uh, similarly in Canada. We already have almost 100 uh, districts adopted, and it's the local activist and the local group who really know, you know, the people who help that congressperson get elected. They know who does their hair and takes care of their children. Um, so this is where your real power resides. And their job then, when somebody says, I'll adopt my district, and therefore they become a point person, finally, where we can direct all the other interests so they can start to coordinate and organize locally and build those local coalitions. We're working with a climate bill package of existing bills that cover all sorts of agriculture bills and plastics and fracking and stopping all the subsidies. You know, all the component pieces are in various bills out there. We put them in a package so that we can unite the activists who care about pesticides and all these individual issues and get them working together. And that's already happening. Meetings are happening all over the country. Um, and more importantly, it's a strategy to get the activists ready to act. So that's our political power. We have a lot of uh, organizations uh, in our network. It's very loosely affiliated right now, but with the Earth Bill, we plan to get people to sign on the dotted line. It covers many groups, including many faith organizations. So that's my presentation on the Earth Bill, a 2030 moonshot for Earth. And I invite you to go to climatecrisispolicy.org and see the digest of all the solutions and um, just uh, help spread the word. And hopefully you'll be interested in maybe coming up with your own Earth Bill in Canada. And uh, I think that those three areas, if we can hit, tackle 80% of our pollution by 2030, it'll be a miracle. And more importantly, it'll test our ability to actually make this transition and, and on a timeline. Because if we wait till 2040 or 2050, as everyone wants to keep putting these you know, imaginary goals into the distance, we can't, then 2040 comes and we realize, oh, we're not on track. 2050 comes and all oh, we missed it. And those tipping points have already happened and it's game over. So we cannot put these ideas into the future. We need to act now. This is an emergency. Life on earth as we know it is at stake. And so we're excited. We feel like we finally found not a magic bullet, but a very clear, demand that activists and the masses can understand. And we have the marketing industry in the United States coming in now, and they're going to start to join to figure out how to send out a, you know, get this into the public awareness. Um, I think once you have a demand that people can believe in, you have a movement. And once you have a movement, you have hope. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to chat about it all.